People may not know this, but Newt Gingrich and his writing partner, Terry Maple, wrote a book a few years ago called, uh, I forget the exact title, Green Conservatism, something along those lines, which took climate change for, for, for granted, the science of it, and, and talked about creating a conservative response to it, which you would think would be the productive thing. For which is like that second conversation we're talking about. <laughs> right, right. Anyway, segue to the present, um, uh, uh, Gingrich and Maple are, are, uh, were assembling this book of essays from other people and one, and, uh, about the problems of the day, and one of them was going to be about climate change from this fantastic climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, who's, who's, whose husband is an evangelical minister and who's an evangelical herself and knows that community very well, and so she spent a lot of time writing this chapter and then found out via seeing a clip on CBS, television, you know, a, a, a woman approached Gingrich at an event and said, I heard you had a clip chapter about climate. Why and would he, you do that? Here's, here's Gingrich's response. I need to ask you about this. Rush had on his program about your next, your next book coming out. has a chapter on global warming, and it's written by a person. We didn't know that they were doing that until the book. Good. That sounds like a good idea, because I thought, why would you want to have somebody like that in your book? That's not going to be in the book. We told him to kill it. So here's here's the tweet from the author, Catherine Hayhoe is her name. Yes. Um, here she she tweets. She says, "Nice to hear that Gingrich is tossing my climate chapter in the trash. A <laughs> hundred plus unpaid hours I could have spent playing with my baby." <laughs> she finds out about it by watching TV that he has killed the chapter that she. I know. Spent. So Catherine Hayhoe, climate scientist, uh, newly uh, famous. <laughs> Infamous. <laughs> Infamous. <laughs> Uh, you've had quite a ride over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, what's that been like for you? It has been tough. As a scientist, this isn't the type of dialogue that we're trained to do. Sci now, make no mistake, scientists can be critical and even vicious sometimes, but our dialogues are conducted uh, usually based on the peer-reviewed literature, they have certain standards of truth and usually decency. And so the, to, to have a very rude awakening, I would say, to the, to the debate on, on uh, climate science that is occurring outside of science was very interesting. And you've had a, a, a little bit of invective directed at you uh, through various uh, channels. Yes. The, uh, the approach seems to be not so much to uh, discredit the science or facts, but to discredit the messenger. A lot of the, of the approach seems to be, you're lying. Um, and as a scientist, we're so conditioned to talk about facts that it's really a shock um, to feel like that, that is the basis under which this conversation is being conducted arguing over who's telling the truth. It's almost, it's, honestly, it's a little bit like in the school ground. You're lying. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. You can go back and forth infinitely, and you can never break that impasse if that's the level that we're arguing at. And so that's why I, as a scientist, feel like facts are so important, because facts are what break our impasse. Do you think there's been an attempt to uh, intimidate? Uh, you know, people have published your email and more or less encouraged uh, abuse and... and uh, you know, yeah. things directed at you? I, I think that there's no question that much of this is intended to intimidate. I mean, just think about it. If you sit down at your computer and you write an email to somebody you've never met and you tell that person that they are a liar, that you hate them, that uh, you're disgusted by what they do, what do you think you're doing by doing that? I mean, you're not setting the person up to have a great day. <laughs> And as, I think there's an extra dimension because as a, woman, as a woman, most of the attacks that I'm receiving are from men. And so that has a very different dynamic to it that honestly can feel very threatening and intimidating sometimes. Uh, you are not only a scientist, but you are an evangelical Christian. Do you think that your community has been especially targeted or especially vulnerable? I'm talking about the evangelical community that they've been especially vulnerable to uh, the uh, arguments of, of the climate denial machine? I think that um, overall there's been a very sad phenomenon happening in the evangelical community, and that is that we are allowing our politics to inform our faith rather than using our faith 
and our values to inform our politics. Okay. Um, any progress on that front, do you think? I hope we can see progress because the issue of, uh, of climate change, but the broader issue really of conserving our resources and loving our neighbor and taking good care of the planet, these are not theological issues that we have a problem with. If you believe in that God was involved in creating the planet in any way, shape, or form, if you believe that we are told to love our neighbor as ourselves, then that's the only basis we need to make smart, sensible decisions. To not only make sure we have a healthy planet to sustain us, but also make sure that we really are loving our global neighbor today the way we should be. So there's no theological differences, really, uh, between us on those issues. What it is, is it's a matter of baggage. The issue of climate change, the greater environmental issues have a lot of baggage attached to them that we as a community have a big problem with. And so I think it's really important for us to detach the core issue, that of loving God and loving our neighbor, from all of the baggage that's been associated with so we can really make decisions that are truly motivated by our values and our faith rather than making decisions because of other things or other people that are peripherally attached to them. Okay, as to your work as a scientist, um, you have been looking at regional impacts in the upper Midwest Great Lakes region. Can you just very quickly tell us uh, any, any conclusions or, or... Sure. Yeah. What I do is I actually look at what climate change is going to mean to us at the local level. And I've looked at the Great Lakes area as well as the Northeast, where I live in Texas, California, and at the national scale as well. Because the reason why we care about climate change, really, is because it's affecting us in the places where we live. It's affecting our family. It will impact our children's lives. It's affecting our community and the things that we hold dear. That's why we care about it. So it's important to put climate change in those terms. It's also important because climate impacts, the majority of climate impacts, are not something new that we've never seen before. We have already made ourselves vulnerable in certain ways, and then climate change comes along and exacerbates those existing issues at the regional scale. So for example, in the Midwest, they're always prone to really bad flood events. And those can you know, damage and carry away houses, they delay planting in the spring, they cause all kinds of damage. Well, what climate change is doing is it's increasing the frequency or the risk of heavy rainfall events. Now, you never know for sure if the one flood you get is exacerbated by climate change or not, but over time we see that these are increasing in frequency because of climate change, but we already have those vulnerabilities. In West Texas, um, we have a, a lot of agriculture, and on a dry year, our water comes from the aquifer under the ground. But we know that we are withdrawing water from the aquifer way too fast, much faster than it's, it's replenishing. So that's a non-sustainable resource that is likely to run dry for many people within a matter of decades. Now that has nothing to do with climate change, but you put climate change on top of that. With warmer temperatures, you need more water to provide the same irrigation. We're also seeing increases in variability and uncertainty in the future. And so we have a system that's already on the edge, and we're concerned about what climate change might do to interact with it. Uh, looking forward uh, to the, the drought in the southwest with the, the La Nina event that we have going on now, uh, are, are we looking for even a longer period of drought? Uh, is, is that the consensus or, or do we even have an idea? Well, for, for this current period of drought we're in, it was uh, initiated by La Nina and we certainly hope we're going to be coming out of it when La Nina goes away. So the projections I've seen are for the La Nina to persist through the spring but then to start to tail off by summer. And that illustrates the fact that we have these natural modes of, cl of climate variability that we've always dealt with and that they're going to continue in the future. And then we have these increasing trends in average and in some case extreme conditions because of climate change that are now being superimposed on them. It's kind of like with our health, you know, we know that a poor diet affects our health and we know that lack of exercise affects our health. But if you have poor diet and lack of exercise together, it's obviously worse than one by itself. So that's what we're seeing with areas of the world that are used to experiencing these type of extremes. We're adding on to it with climate change and that's why we're concerned about it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I greatly admire your work and your courage mm -hmm. and uh, uh, 
I hope that we can uh, continue to communicate. Likewise, thank you. Great.